name's Joanna House. I work at Bristol University. I'm currently a Leverhulme Research Fellow at Bristol University and with the Bristol Cabot Institute. And my research is on land use change and greenhouse gas emissions. And that's deforestation, afforestation, use of land for bioenergy. So there's all different types of emissions for, due to human activity. Uh, fossil fuels account for the majority of emissions, but also land use change. So basically deforestation, but also all different kinds of activity on the land contribute to both emissions and sinks on carbon cycle. Um, at the moment, land use change, primarily deforestation, accounts for about 10% of all CO2 emissions. Um, and fossil fuel account for most of the rest. Um, historically though, if we look back to about from the pre-industrial period, so from about the 1750s to today, then land use change accounts for about 30% of all emissions. So particularly when there were large changes and expansion of agriculture and fossil fuel use was still quite low, and land use change emissions were much more significant. So over the whole, the history of, not the entire history of human emissions, but really going back for the significant big changes in human activity, then land use change is about 30%. Of course, prior to the Industrial Revolution, when we didn't have big use of fossil fuels, then land use changes were the main source of emissions when you had very early expansion of agriculture. But the land is also a sink for carbon dioxide. So plants take up carbon dioxide when they grow. And when emissions were quite low level, for just from land use change before fossil fuels, then the land was also able to respond to that higher concentration and take up carbon, CO2, excess of CO2 in the atmosphere. So then the land was more or less in balance. Uh, now, fossil fuel emissions are so high, land use change emissions are also still high, um, and carbon dioxide is going up at such a rapid rate that the natural sinks for CO2, the ocean and the land, can't respond fast enough to keep up with the emissions and therefore you've got rising CO2 in the atmosphere. When, when plants um, grow, when they, they take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and release oxygen, and that process is known as photosynthesis, um, plants also have a respire, it's called um, autotrophic respiration, when they do the reverse. So at night time, they'll release CO2. Um, during the day, they take up CO2 and release oxygen. At night time, they release a bit of CO2. But the net effect is still to take up CO2, and that provides the carbon that is the basis of the carbohydrates for plant growth. When, that, when those plants die, and the organic matter decomposes, and that's another type of respiration called heterotrophic respiration that also releases carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And then but not all of the carbon respires, some of it goes into the soil, and then you have long-term sinks, and you have inert carbon in the soil that is very hard to decompose, and so you get very long-term carbon sinks in soils. The carbon cycle is very simply, it's about the cycling of carbon through natural systems, through plants, through the soils, through the ocean, and it back out into the atmosphere. Um, and the carbon cycle, the carbon is constantly flowing between these different systems, and large amounts of carbon moves all the time. But without anthropogenic influence, those systems are roughly in balance if you look over long, long time periods. The plants I mean, the, the massive, the natural flows of carbon are massive. So, for example, um, global gross primary production, which is actually the amount of carbon that plants take up before any respiration, is about 120 gigatons of carbon and when you, uh, per year. When you look at what emissions are due to land use change, deforestation, then we're talking about one gigaton carbon per year. So the natural flows are massive. And it's why it's quite difficult picking out the um, net human impacts against this natural, very large background flow, flux. So although the human emissions are much smaller than the natural fluxes, the natural fluxes approximately are in balance. And so they're not causing a net increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, the human emissions, however, are very rapid and the natural systems don't have time to respond to them and so you get a net imbalance of uh, raised carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. In the Earth's past, 
um, throughout, deep in and out of the ice ages. Um, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere ranged between about 180 parts per million and 280 parts per million. And it took thousands of years for it to change between those states. The difference is now it's gone up to 350 and even topping 400 parts per million on a, on a single day basis. Um, and that's happened over a period of a couple of hundred years. Instead of a change that's happened over thousands of years within bounds that have remained quite similar in and out of the last few ice ages, we've now gone up way above those bounds over where we and the rate of change is very rapid. Residence time when people are discussing greenhouse gases is thought of as the amount of time it takes for a pulse of CO2, a uh, pulse of a greenhouse gas to be taken out of the atmosphere. So if you emitted a pulse of carbon dioxide, how long would it take for you, that pulse of carbon dioxide that you've added to the atmosphere not to be seen in the atmosphere anymore? Um, with methane and with nitrous oxide, greenhouse gases, that's an easier calculation to make. And for methane, it's about 14 years for that additional pulse to be removed from the atmosphere. And for nitrous oxide, it's about 114 years. For carbon dioxide, that calculation is not so easy to make. There's not a single residence time because there's a multitude of different processes that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So, for example, the uh, uh, CO2 from the atmosphere dissolves in the surface of the ocean and then that's turned over and taken into the deep ocean. And really, for an amount of CO2 to be completely removed from the atmosphere, it has to be completely dissolved and go down into the deep ocean. And then we're talking about geological timescales, so hundreds of thousands of years. Whereas there are also very short processes that are taking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So for example, that dissolution into the ocean surface and taken up by plants. So about 65 to 80% of the carbon dioxide pulse that's put into the atmosphere will be removed within about two to 200 years. The rest of it, the remaining sort of 35% will take between 2 and 20 millennia to be completely removed from the atmosphere. So roughly you have to think whatever we're doing today, whatever CO2 is being emitted, roughly a third of it is going to stick around essentially, you know, forever really when you consider it in our lifetime. I have come across people saying that residence time for CO2 is 100 years and I've, that's a common misconception actually I've heard from the policy community and I've even seen uh, written in articles about climate change. And I, I think that, I, I'm not really sure where that comes from and I think it might be to do with when people are talking about the relative uh, global warming potential of different greenhouse gases at different scales and often they look at the 100 year time scale and compare other gases to carbon dioxide on the 100 year time scale. But that doesn't mean the residence time is 100 years. A third of what we put up remains in the atmosphere for millennia. I've not come across the argument that rising CO2 in the atmosphere is caused by ocean warming. No, although the ocean warming does uh, reduce the solubility of CO2 in the surface ocean, so it reduces the efficiency of the ocean sink in the same way that climate change also affects land sinks as vegetation and soils respond to warming and changes in precipitation. Land use emissions in the future are going to depend very much on what uh, we do with land in terms of needing cropland. That's going to be the biggest driver of land use change in the future is how much land do we need to grow food to feed an increasingly rising population that is also becoming increasingly dependent on meat which requires large crop areas to produce animal feed. It's very uncertain, but um, how that expansion of agricultural, how big that expansion of agricultural land will be. But if we continue to have population rise and we can't increase yields to meet that population rise, then we're going to have to continue to deforest more areas to plant more crops. So um, no current scenarios, future scenarios that um, account for population growth and feed in human population have negative emissions from land use. Some of them do have large areas of afforestation that's driven by climate policy. So you run these through models that model various human systems and if you impose a high carbon tax then that leads to it being economically viable to forest large areas. So you do have large areas of afforestation but land use emissions
still remain positive. Um, I did a degree in environmental science and at the time climate change was a, a emerging important topic and I got very interested in it. I was also very interested in bioenergy at the time um, as a means of providing fuel for impoverished people and also as a way of mitigating climate. Um, then I got involved in the IPCC I was employed initially as to, uh, to assist one of the convening lead authors working on the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports. Um, and I, I really enjoyed the whole process of synthesising science and then presenting it to the policy community. And ever since then I've carried on working within climate change science. Also I had quite a passion for rainforests and seeing the rate of dis destruction of rainforests and wanting to link that both to the dual purposes of climate mitigation and biodiversity protection by slowing down the rate of rainforest loss. Although I work on climate change, because I work specifically from the land point of view, I guess the key question is how we continue to feed a rising population. And be because the land use change emissions are so dominated just by how much agricultural land we're going to need, and how much of that land is taken from carbon-rich rainforests or grown on peatlands which have very carbon-rich soils. So, th I mean, the biggest question, which is also quite a big question for humans, is how we feed, how we feed a rising population in the future. Um, specific questions around land use is really about how we can protect as much natural forest area while continuing to feed that population. So that would be the, the big question for me. Mm. Scientists aren't always the best people to um, communicate because it's not necessarily how we're trained. We're trained to do science and it, it's an increasing pressure on us to communicate, but I think it's very important. I think the IPCC is actually a very good system of being able to enable scientists to come together and do science and having people who are experts in pulling that together and being able to present it in a way that's useful to the policy community and to, and to public and different kinds of organisations and bodies that want to use that climate data. Obviously, I think engagement is important and I do speak to the policy community and I think that's great, but most scientists don't have training to do that. And I think it's really difficult, particularly talking to the media. I think scientists aren't trained for that. We've not gone into that profession because it's not what we're good at. Uh, and so it's quite a big learning curve. However, there's other people putting forward information to the media all the time that's incorrect and we need to be able to engage with that somehow. The major way humans have an impact on climate is by burning fossil fuels. And if we want to do something to reduce climate impacts, then we have to reduce our fossil fuel burning. That's the bottom line. 90% of emissions come from fossil fuels. Um, and we could plant forests, that takes some CO2 out of the atmosphere. But really, that's only taking out the CO2 that was put into the atmosphere from cutting forests in the first place. The major thing we have to do is reduce our fossil fuel emissions. But I think there's also other important things we need to consider, which is about forest protection and not having further emissions from forests. And that's useful from a climate perspective and also biodiversity, protecting different communities as well. And other things that tie in with that, for example, looking at our personal diet and use of resources. But really the key is finding an alternative for fossil fuels for providing energy that's technically and socially acceptable.